Hi, everyone. Dr. Liz here. Welcome to the Hypnotize Me podcast. I'm glad you're here. Glad you're listening and learning. And hopefully it will help you with your journey along the way. I am a psychotherapist with a specialty in anxiety, insomnia, and deeper emotional healing. Hypnosis is one of the tools in my toolbox that I use to help people feel better and to help people be better. I do work all over the world. Please feel free to reach out and contact me if you would like some help. I've been an entrepreneur for most of my adult life. Built an award-winning company, sold it, and then focused mainly on my private practice. That gives you a unique perspective, especially my ability to work with people in business at all kinds of levels. Before I go, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can go and subscribe to the newsletter and you'll get free hypnosis downloads that you can listen to immediately. Another way is to buy one of the downloads that I have for sale. I only have a couple up there, but they're good ones. They've stood the test of time. I made the decision to not run ads during my podcast because I really do see it as an act of service. I completely respect people who do have ads on their podcast, but it's just not my path. All right, everyone, enjoy the episode, and I hope to see you back here soon. Hi, everyone, Dr. Liz here. This is episode 300. I will tell you, it's quite an accomplishment as a small niche podcaster <laughs> to do 300 episodes. Like, woof, that's a lot. I tell you, I started the podcast in 2016. So fresh one aired 11, 29, 2016, November 29th. 2016, in that first uh, couple of years, I think three years, maybe four. Looking at my spreadsheet here, definitely four years. <laughs> um, five years, I did weekly episodes, weekly episodes. I think I didn't switch to every other week until my sixth year or so. I'm looking again at the spreadsheet. So I did five years of weekly episodes with some breaks here and there, but that's a lot. Then I switched to every other week um, and that's more manageable for me. And I've pretty much kept that with some breaks here and there, of course. But yeah, I have not reached a million downloads yet. Probably if I counted up all my YouTube plays as well, maybe, but I'm very, very close. So I thought, okay, I'll reach a million downloads and then I'll stop podcasting. Um, and then it was like, oh, I'll go to 300 episodes and then I'll stop podcasting. But I still have stuff to say. I still have stuff to share with you. So I think I'm going to keep going. I just aired an episode about how do you know hypnosis is working? And I talked about hypnosis for bladder leakage for women. I thought, oh, I would love to have the hypnotherapist on, Lisa Viviano, who actually does that. Like that would help so many women. So there's that. There's other ideas I want to talk about, how to make a big decision that comes up for a lot of people. Like how do I make a big life-changing decision and the fear that goes with that sometimes and how do you do that? It's another idea. So I keep an ideas list and believe me, there's like a million ideas. So I don't think I'm done yet. Today, I thought I would talk about volunteering because I get asked quite a bit about it. If you're on my newsletter or you've listened to the podcast for any length of time, you probably hear me talk about volunteering at the cat shelter with the cats. People ask me, how do I do that without adopting a million cats? <laughs> and so I thought I'd give some tips about volunteering in general and also how to volunteer at a cat shelter without adopting a million cats. I can't guarantee you're going to not be a cat lady, <laughs> but I can say I have some tips about, you know, not going over two cats or three cats or whatever that, that um, limit is for you. Let's quickly review the benefits of volunteering mental health, for sure, people are happier. This is all based on research studies. People are happier, they have a greater sense of purpose, they're less depressed, 
self-confidence. They have a greater sense of social well-being and life satisfaction. Now there's a caveat to this. The caveat is not if you're volunteering with depressed people, for real. Like this is what the research says. If you're volunteering on like a suicide hotline, it, yeah, you're not going to get all those benefits. You may get some different benefits like, oh, I helped save some lives today, but you actually don't get a whole lot of the happiness benefits. So sense of purpose, you absolutely get perhaps some self-confidence, but happiness not going to go up if you're doing that. <laughs> but pretty much that's the only category that um, happiness doesn't increase when you volunteer Hey, when we first started volunteering at the cat shelter, my youngest daughter was very depressed. It was during COVID. I had called a colleague and um, she said, oh, she needs to know she matters to someone other than you. Like other, she knows she matters to you, but something else outside of the family, outside of herself. And she loves cats. And so that's how we started volunteering at the cat shelter. And we've done that for three years. And the other day, it was the week before she was going to move to college in a different town. And one of the owners of the cat shelter said to me, she has transformed. Like when she first started, she could not even look me in the eye. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to get to your ear. <laughs> It really helped transform her. And she was right. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we did during those three years, but the cat shelter was a huge part of that. And she learned about how to take care of the cats and give them medicine and flea comb. <laughs> she says one of her hobbies is flea combing now, <laughs> which is super funny. Um but yeah, it helped her so much, her mental health. Like those cats um, love her. They come to recognize you when you go every week and she loved them. And so, yeah, you, it can help transform you. Absolutely. Physical health. People actually live longer who volunteer. They have a greater sense of health, like self-perceived when they say, you know, rate how healthy you are. Right? They're not taking blood work or stuff. It also gives you some activity, like you're getting out of the house and doing something. If you're volunteering from home, you're still, you have something to do. So that helps with your physical health. Career exploration. I think this is definitely a good one probably more for younger people, but certainly for older people too. If you're trying to figure out how to switch careers or you want to do something different, volunteering is actually a way that they recommend to test something out. When I came out of graduate school, I was pretty burned out. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a therapist anymore. I actually sought a job in tech. So I became a, um, a, one of the early web designer programmers because I had taught myself how to do that in graduate school, actually, when the web was just beginning, literally, <laughs> like 1995, 1996. And so I volunteered at a dog training place because I thought I wanted to train dogs instead of be a therapist. I volunteered there for about two years and discovered I didn't want to train dogs. I was good at it, but um, I didn't like the owners. Like the owners are really difficult. <laughs> now I'm a dog owner, okay? So <laughs> um, I find this really funny. I was not a dog owner at the time. I had dogs growing up, but you know, you go to college and grad school, it's hard to have a dog sometimes. So I didn't have one at the time. I was like, oh my God, they're like parents. I was a child specialist at the time. I was burning out. <laughs> the parents were so hard to deal with. And they are. I, as a parent, am hard to deal with. <laughs> Even if I try to be an easy to deal with parent. No, parents are parents. You know, we're trying to take care of our little cubs. So there's an element there that we're hard to deal with. So anyway, it taught me, okay, <laughs> I don't want to be a dog trainer. I'm going to stick with programming right now. So it's a good way to explore something. Now they do differentiate, the research literature differentiates between other-oriented volunteering and self-oriented 
volunteering. So self-oriented volunteering is like people volunteering as a way to get ahead somehow or look good um, versus other oriented is helping others, helping their community, even helping animals. Like you're doing it to help someone else outside yourself, not necessarily just for yourself to look good. So the benefits really come from other oriented volunteering. Just so you know, that's the vast majority of people, really. And sometimes you can get a clue of this, of whether someone's doing it because they have to, like, oh, I'm doing this to advertise my business versus I'm doing this because I really believe in this organization, this cause. There's a difference there. Another reason to volunteer is it's fun. (laughs) Like you meet people if you're social. Um, If you're not, then you find some activity you can do where you don't have to interact so much with people. If it's not fun, I suggest looking for a different volunteer experience. So I have volunteered most of my life. My parents used to make me (laughs) volunteer when I was younger. But then when I went to college, I did it on my own. I remember my New Year's resolution the first year in college was to volunteer at least once a week. And so off and on, pretty much since then, I've been volunteering. So I've tried out a lot of different things. And I can say the better fit for you, the better the volunteer experience. So choose indoor, outdoor, a lot of volunteering is outdoor. If you don't like to be outdoor, don't do that. There's more structured versus less. So some organizations require that you're there, I don't know, Tuesday, Thursday from two to four, and that's it. And you can't do less. Um, They don't want you there more. If that doesn't work for you, move on. You got to consider noise level. So there's an organization here feeding South Florida is part of a larger organization, Feeding Florida, that helps feed hungry families and children and individuals, adults. And they have this huge warehouse where you can go and help pack up boxes to give to people. But they put on extremely loud, like uh, club level Latin music, okay, when they're doing these shifts. (laughs) So it's about a two hour, no, I think it's a three hour shift minimum or something. And so I did that a couple of times and realized like, this is not a good fit for me. I hate the noise. It's super stressful. You have to lift a lot, which I can lift, but there's some really heavy items I couldn't. So I had to ask for help for that. And you're sort of interrupting the flow with someone else. So I realized like, this isn't a good fit for me, actually. (laughs) This one is not. The cat shelter is the opposite. It is super quiet, like a zero noise, pretty much, which Evan and I loved. Like we would go in and we do some cleaning and scooping of litter boxes. And then we like groom the cats. And for, when I first started, they called me the reader because I would take my book and I would sit and read and pet a cat. There's always cats who want petting and need petting. <laughs> and after I did my cleaning, that's what I would do. So that was a really good fit for us and for Eva too. She's very, um, she has all kinds of sensory stuff because of her autism. And me, I consider myself HSP, highly sensitive person. So light, sound, clothing, textures, that type of thing. One of her friends went with us And the cat shelter was not a good fit for her because she has OCD around like cleanliness and it's, it's dirty. Okay. No matter how clean you try to keep a cat shelter, it's dirty. So she found like she couldn't do it. She, that was not a good fit for her. So you've got to consider these different factors and don't feel bad. If it's not a good fit, just move on and find some place that is, is what I say. The other factor there is what your heart calls you to do. With the Feeding South Florida, the Hungry Families, I decided to donate money instead, like a monthly amount, because my heart calls me to do that. I love cats. (laughs) I love them more now that I volunteered at a cat shelter. So it's like my heart really called me to do that. Now that Eva's at college, I uh, still go because I really like it. And it, it feels like a connection to her as well. So what is your heart calling you to do? When I was training dogs, I love dogs. And so 
I was like, oh, I'll go try that out. Like I'll volunteer, see if it's a good fit. And I love dogs. So you've got to see what your heart calls you to do. If your heart is calling you to go to another country and volunteer and do a work trip like that, go for it. Go for it. What is your heart calling you to do? All right, let's get more specific about how not to adopt a million cats <laughs> if you're volunteering at a cat shelter or dogs. Actually, we went to the Humane Society the other day because I get my uh, dogs like flea medication there and stuff. It's it's lower cost than if I buy it online or something or at the vet. And so I don't usually go in the section with all the dogs, but Eva and her, her partner were there. <laughs> that day. And so we went and visited the dogs and dogs are loud, (laughs) like super loud. They barky, barky, barky. And I realized like, oh, yeah, this wouldn't be a good fit for me actually to volunteer. The Humane Society, which has, you know, all kinds of animals, cats and dogs mainly, but bunnies too, and that type of thing. But also it's like, oh, I want to take all those dogs home, all of them. Like, oh, you're so cute. Oh, you're so cute. Oh, you're the cutest, like all of them. So it was hard. Um, So how not to take the dogs and cats home. My top tip is have one at home (laughs) who is old or antisocial that doesn't get along with other cats or other dogs. Um, Dogs particularly are, you know, you can integrate them into a pack, but sometimes they don't integrate and you have to take the dog back or something. That's a a way to tell is sometimes you foster a cat or dog, you do a trial and if they don't fit, then you can take them back. But my 14 year old cat She still has not adjusted to the kitten we adopted at like six months from the shelter because she wasn't getting adopted. Like pretty much all of her cohort had been adopted, but her, and we really loved her. So we thought, okay, let's take her home, see how she does. My old cat still doesn't like her. Like they have sort of a neutral um, understanding, let's say, but the little one still wants to play with the old one. The old one's like, eh, get away, hisses at her and stuff. So it helps to have an older animal at home that doesn't get along with other animals. That stops me a lot from taking cats home. There's definitely some that I would have um, adopted. Mambo, who's this gigantic cat with like one cloudy eye. Um, Smokey, I was there the night he came in. This little gray and white adorable kitten. I would have adopted him. Somebody adopted him before me because he was so adorable. <laughs> there was one, oh my gosh, I don't remember his name. He was this little white cat with blue eyes. So it was Siamese somewhere in him. And he would jump and catch flies. Adorable. <laughs> okay. I was like, oh my God, this is a great cat to have with mosquitoes and flies in Florida. He got adopted super fast too. So sometimes that can help if you just wait a couple weeks or a couple months and you say, okay, let me see if this cat gets adopted. And then if they don't, I'll reconsider it. So you just sort of put it off for a while. That can help. You talk yourself out of it. You know that they're safe. You can visit next week or tomorrow, however often you want to go. Um, The other thing that stops me is they cost money. Vet bills, food, animals are expensive where I live. I don't know where you live, but where I live, it it takes some money to support them, to take them to the vet and do anti-flea stuff and their heartworm. And yeah, that stops me sometimes. It seems like the first sort of triples every time you get a new animal, even if they're not long haired cats, it's like, oh, the fur somehow is all over the place. It doesn't just double when you get that extra cat, it like triples. So that stops me too. I don't want any more fur. So those are my top tips for volunteering and how not to adopt a million cats when you volunteer at a cat shelter. Okay, that's it. You can go and enjoy them at the shelter. You know that you're going to see them next week and hope that they get adopted before you adopt them. (laughs) All right, people, I hope you are healthy and safe. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.
I hope you truly enjoyed today's episode. Remember that you can get free hypnosis downloads over at my website, drlizhypnosis.com, D-R-L-I-Z hypnosis.com. I work all over the world doing hypnosis. So if you're interested in working with me, please schedule a free consultation over at my website and we'll see what your goals are and if I can be of service to you in helping you reach them. Finally, if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the podcast or tell a friend. That way, more and more people learn about the power of hypnosis. All right, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Peace. This podcast is not mental health treatment, nor should it replace mental health treatment. If you need therapy or hypnotherapy, please seek treatment from a trained professional.